Welcome to Missionary Roundtable with your host, Kale Horvath. Welcome back to Missionary Roundtable. Thank you guys for joining us. My name is Kale Horvath. I'm your host, and I'm excited to be back with you guys discussing the Great Commission ministry and foreign and international and cross-cultural missions through the lens of pastors and missionaries who are out there doing the work. This week, I'm really excited to introduce my guest to you guys. His name is Brian Hedges. Brian is the pastor of Heartland Baptist Fellowship in Harrisonville, Missouri. Uh, His church supports many missionaries around the world, and they themselves are a church plant uh, that was started. And so I'm really excited to have Brian on. Brian, thanks so much for being here. Kale, thanks for having me. Uh, How long have you been the pastor at Heartland Baptist Fellowship? Uh, 18 years. Wow. And and forgive me, uh, was that a church plant that you started or were you just on the church planting team? No, uh, it was a a church plant out of Kansas City Baptist Temple. I was the church planter and now I'm the pastor. Awesome. So you came from Kansas City Baptist Temple, which a lot of people who listen to this uh, would probably at least be familiar with. Mm-hmm. And so that's where your uh, pastoral training would have happened? Yeah, I uh, was in Shepherd School of Ministry from uh, 1994 through 98 mm-hmm. and uh, started working down here uh, after uh, you know a few years on the circuit and preparing to go to what I thought would be uh, you know, an associate type job or youth pastor job in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just really convicted about going out that way where my wife's from and, uh, the Lord shut the door and, uh, I came back and was sitting around going, what next? And our missions pastor said, Hey, why don't you go, uh, check out this home Bible study in Harrisonville and, uh, see what happens until God opens up another door. And here I am <laughs> 20 years later. Wow. Oh, <laughs> praise the Lord, man. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, we, I, I've had, uh, other guys like Paul Clark on the show and, uh, we've talked about, you know, all missions is, is just doing that, what you're talking about there, and then doing it just, you know, in a place where they don't speak our language. <laughs> it's just yeah. starting a Bible study, starting a church and discipling believers. So praise yeah. the Lord for that, man. Uh, what kind of missions experience do you have? Um, like uh, trips that you've been on, places you've been to? Oh, that's a good question. <clears throat> My first uh, trip was uh, actually an evangelistic trip with a guy named Leo Humphrey uh, down in Honduras in my early 20s. Oh, okay. So it's another, it's another gener. it was a whole generation ago. So <laughs> literally like the chicken coop and all that was on the airplane when we landed. So that was my first <laughs> trip, trip and it did alter my life. Uh, you know, everyone that uh, is born again, I really, especially if you're an American, you need to get outside of the, mm. out of the country. There's a lot of cross-cultural ministry we can do here for sure. But uh, there is something about leaving uh, the confines of the USA and getting in another culture. So that was my first taste. And then, um, uh, you know, getting married and, and coming up at KCBT, had a lot of exposure to missions, of course, uh, my early years getting started in my career and my marriage. I didn't have the finances to take a lot of those trips, but I, I supported other missionaries and other people and some of my disciples. Uh, one of those guys was a guy named Doug Howie, uh, mm-hmm. who went to Romania. And then so we ended up taking our, our second trip over there, Amy and I and, and some uh, friends and visited and supported them in Romania in their first tour. And then... Uh, after that, uh, you know, uh, did a lot of discipleship trips and what have you. And, and since I've been pastor here at Heartland, I've I've uh, spent quite a bit of time in India, um, you know, visited Bhutan, Nepal, and uh, also Europe, you know, Brian Clark. I've spent some time mm-hmm. in London working with yeah. him. Just, and of course, all these are short time trips, short, short, short term trips, I should say, rather. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and then just, uh, uh, you know, Mexico and um and uh, Africa was my most recent, uh, you know, for me, a new mm-hmm. trip that I've a place I've never been last year in April. I had the privilege of joining uh, Pastor Randy Foster there in uh, in a uh, resurrection conference. It was really awesome down there in Lusaka, in oh, the uh, awesome. capital of uh, Zambia. Yeah. So I was able to see Randy reacquaint with a lot of his uh, disciples from his time in Africa as a missionary. And so we had a great time with that trip. And uh, I was scheduled to be in India once again. Um mm-hmm. Uh, here uh, right when this COVID crisis hit. So again, training pastors as we've matured in the ministry here at HBF. And, and uh, of course, Doug Pearson's a good friend of ours. Um, uh, and we've been involved in his work since it began. Um, so 
uh, that has led us to contacts and, and really the pastoral training aspects that we've been involved with the last, you know, over a decade now. And so we're trusting the Lord for proving and, that. And, and you're talking about like training national pastors, uh, I assume that's the ministry you're involved in. Yeah. Yeah. So we kind of have, uh, we still do the, a lot of the exploratory type of missions trips. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, we like to have, uh, I have three levels that I've kind of set forth here. Um, so, you know, few people can get on no matter where you're at in your spiritual growth process. So, uh, you know, they're kind of tiered in uh, what the, the goals and objectives are. So the top tier then is the pastoral training. Uh-huh. And the middle tier, tier is there has to be some proficiency in discipleship before we hit the field and go overseas. And then there's kind of a lower tier, which is a service oriented type of trip, which can be foreign or domestic, but doesn't need the the rigor so much of discipleship training. You know, it's just, hey, man, if you want to go, come on. That's on a, that's a really cool organization. So you've just kind of organized it in a way that makes it really clear of, you know, one, two or three. If you have no discipleship training or anything, but you just want to go see the field, you well, this is the kind of trip that would be good for you. And then like you said, the middle ground for someone who's got some discipleship behind their belt. And then, you know, if they're a leader and teaching, then they would go on these pastoral training ones. Yeah. Yeah. And we look for like our Institute level guys to, yeah, we want them on those third level trips with us that we want them when we're training pastors, we want some of those Institute folks with us. And That's so awesome. when they enter the Institute, we have an expectation that they'll be traveling with us. So mm-hmm. they're, then there, and I have an expectation our pastors are out traveling. And so sure. I really, uh, you know, and I've inherited all that. Basically, that's my discipleship heritage from mm-hmm. KCBT, you know, and and, uh, and so Pastor Jeff Adams and, and the missions environment that we had back in the day, um, you know, it's just it's just I just brought it here, you know. Yeah, and that's what we're doing. Could you speak on uh, and and please include your experience because you said you know that first trip uh, going to Honduras uh, changed changed your life. Was speaking to just the average church member who's listening to this, maybe they've never been on a short-term mission trip. What, what does a short-term mission trip do to the mind of a believer who's never been outside of their own Christian bubble? Why, why should, why should they go on one? Yeah. Uh, you know, they, because the Lord commanded it. <laughs> <laughs> you can take the easy cop out on me. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, but the, you know, really it is a, it is a issue of faith, isn't it? I yeah. Think. You know, you really it's one thing to know what you need to do. It's another thing to do it. And uh, I think it takes you, you know, the, in the in the common vernacular, right? It takes us out of our comfort zone. Mm. And, um, and, you know, it causes us to really walk by faith. Um, you you get out of their surroundings and you see the, the world as Jesus sees it. And so, um, you know, what's as as it happens, you know, um, it, it's it, when you're a young Christian and you, you have a context in which you're being discipled, you know, uh, you tend to think this is it, you know, whether yeah. it's New Philly or HBF or, you know, when I was young, KCBT, this is it. This is this is the Mecca, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then you get out and you find, wow, you know, uh, Jesus is working other places. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. And Jesus is the same, you know, another language, another culture. Everything is foreign to you. But the main thing you see when you take a short term trip is you see Jesus and mm-hmm. you're like, wow, he is working. And uh, he's working in other people, other languages and things that you're uncomfortable with, that you don't understand, that you don't even comprehend. You're, you're struggling. All your senses are open. You know, you're, you're just out of your comfort zone, walking by faith. You're sensitive to the Lord. And then what do you see? You see Jesus. You yeah. know? And, and I just think that was that's that's incredible when you get to another place, another culture. And uh, then you see Jesus working in that culture. It's uh, mm. it's it'll change your life, you know, and it also helps, uh, I think, put your your. Um, you in perspective as a, as a, as a saint, you know, what does God set you apart for? And it's to accomplish his mission and mm-hmm. it makes it tangible. You know, you know why mm-hmm. you're given to missions, you know, who you're giving uh, oftentimes now to missions and you know what they're doing. And right. so there's just so many uh, blessings that come from, yeah. uh, you know, getting out on the field. And I know, now I know Kale, you're going to be a missionary and, and to all my missionary friends, I do know that it's, it's not always, you know, fun to entertain a mission. And I think short term <laughs> trips can take people, you know, maybe off mission a little bit. Um, and so that's why I think it's important for us. I'm kind of segueing to my own discussion here, but it's <laughs> for us getting back to those three levels. That's why I, I developed those three levels because you just don't, you don't want to go on a missions trip or as a pastor, you don't want to take your people on a trip uh, that's going to burden the missionary. So we mm-hmm. try to look for real battles and um, 
that where when we get there, it's actually a help and not a hindrance to what's going on. No, I, that's awesome. And, uh, you know, and the Bible tells us that our, my, my eye affecteth my heart. And when people go and they see the need, I, I think that it can affect them. I, well, first of all, I don't know of any missionary who, at least today, let's say that, because we're going to get to some past missionaries uh, in, the, in the theme of our podcast. But I don't know of any missionaries today that uh, surrendered their life to missions without going and seeing it. I, I don't know. Maybe that happens occasionally. But for me, it was when I went and saw and was like, oh, my, this is uh, this is the thing. And I, I mean, I, I had surrendered my life to the possibility that God would use me for missions uh, years ago. And, and, and really, that was it was just a being willing to do whatever God would have me to do. It, like like Pastor Mark Trotter's always said, are you willing to do whatever, whenever, wherever? And, right. and when I made that uh, surrender, I, I knew that God might move me someday. I, I didn't know if he would, but I knew he might. And uh, I went on a missions trip with uh, my pastor, Jeff Bartell, uh, to Albania to visit his churches uh, that he's got there. And uh, they're still thriving. They're still discipling. They're sending out missionaries and planting churches. Um, and I remember when I, I don't know what it was for me, and may, maybe it was just a weird emotional thing, but whenever I was there and uh, in the worship service and they were worshiping God to a, a melody of a worship song that I recognized, but it was in their tongue. Uh, man, that broke me. And that's when I knew I, I have to go to the ends of the world. I have to, I can't stay where I'm at, right? It, it was just like that little glimpse of, of before the throne of God someday where every tribe and, and tongue is worshiping yeah. the Father. Amen, man. That's absolutely the, the case. And I tell you, it, it does. It changes your life. It changes your perspective. And, um, you know, I myself, I was willing uh, whenever, wherever, you know, it really does expand your um, your willingness to be used of God. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can see the need in a different way that uh, and if causes you to do that, Isaiah, you know, here am I, send me. Uh, yeah. If, if that's what it takes, I'll go, you know. Right, right, right. It, Use me. And at the very least, you go see the field. And if you're not going, it, it, it certainly affects how you give, uh, <laughs> I think. I mean, it, it affected how I gave. So the Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that that's the order that God gives it in. Because when you start to invest in something, your heart follows it. And so you go see the mission field. It affects your heart. You start giving to the field and then your heart follows and you start caring more about that. And in my case, it ended up, you know, from just giving mon more money incrementally over time to giving my whole family and my life into the offering plate. So, you know, I, I guess I I'm saying out there to the church members, I guess don't give money to missions. If you're, uh, if you're worried that God might send you cause he might. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's right. All right, brother. So let's get into, uh, kind of the, the theme for today. And uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the Philadelphian church age or what has, is commonly referred to um, in some circles as the golden age of missions. Um, so Brian, if you wouldn't mind and uh, feel free to take us to Revelation 3, um, could, could you tell people what is the Philadelphian church age? Uh, why why do we call it that? And, and why is it often referred to as the golden age of missions? Yeah, we, uh, well, I think, we got a lot of people listening to this. So um, let me just start by, you know, sharing how we break down the course of history without getting too detailed um, since the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ until, you know, this day we, we see in revelation two and three, seven churches that we break down in the, into church ages that you can see a pattern um, uh, throughout the, the last 2000 years of how God has worked through the church in each of those church ages and uh, as we get to Revelation chapter three, um, uh, the sixth of the seven churches is called the Church of Philadelphia. And uh, this church is unique in that it uh, has the key of David. Mm. And I don't know if we're going to read the scripture or what, uh, what have you, but this this church yeah, age. You, you want to go just ahead, read, read it for yeah, us? Let's do it. it. Yeah. Revelation chapter three. Um, verse, this, uh, seven. verse seven. Yeah. It says the angel of the Church of Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is Holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. 
because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come, come upon the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And then he says in verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. <clears throat> Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go uh, no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down from out of heaven uh, from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. So mm -hmm. that's the uh, six of the seven churches, the last one being the Laodicean church age, which we often talk about. So uh, this period of history, uh, you know, some people get more dogmatic on when when the, the dates are. But definitely from 1500 to around 1900 is what I dated. I don't know where you dated. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I usually say 15 or 1600, you know, yeah, based on yeah. another circumstance in history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Exactly, 1600 forward. But uh, but in that general time frame, God was doing a great work, and uh, not just in you know that Reformation, but uh, with that, the missions movements that came, as, as uh, we know. And, and we see a lot of these parallels uh, from the, the literal historical church of Philadelphia and what the Lord was saying uh, to John. Um, and then we see in church history, of course, that uh, the Word of God was produced um, in the English language and the door opened around the world, uh, mm -hmm. but not just for commerce, but of course on those, on those trails of commerce, uh, came the word of God all over the planet. And that's why the sun never set on the British empire mm -hmm. because it became a global influence for missions. Uh, which, which course, is really amazing. Cause like, like you said there, so it's often also called the church of the open door because of verse eight. Jesus says, behold, I've set before thee an open door that no yeah. man can shut it. And and he continually talks about uh, holding fast the word. He, he keeps making emphasis on the word and what we see in history at that point. And that, yeah, it's 16th, 17th century um, is the translation of the English Bible and the evolution of that to uh, the King James in 1611. And then what we're going to kind of see today is some of the missionaries in that time period who took that book and went to the ends of the earth with it. Yeah, amen. Yeah, and then that's exactly what happened. The, the the door was open, and of course, in verse nine, the synagogue of Satan is mentioned, uh, which we can go back earlier and look at the you know the deeds and the doctrines of the Nicolaitans and see mm -hmm. how all that develops, and and we see that uh, the power, uh, the power of Rome, um, uh, I wouldn't say evaporated, uh, but it loosened. Uh, there were inquisitions up to the eighteen hundreds, and mm -hmm. um, you know, so Rome was was and is still at work, uh, but but definitely there was a, a liberty. That uh, you know, before that time, it just wasn't available. Um, sure. I just taught church history in our in our institute. And oh, was, awesome! Uh, so it's right on your brain right yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, all this stuff's rolling through my head. But you know, you look at a lot of the people that we'll probably talk about here in a few minutes, and and you say, well, they weren't Baptists, and well, because <laughs> uh, Baptists were running for their lives until about seventeen seventy six. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah, and, and so uh, like you said, so not only does the Bible play a huge role that, you know, the translation of the English Bible in uh, the global missions effort of the Golden Age of Missions, but also the fact that uh, Rome and other world powers weren't directly killing all the Christians who were doing that as much, right? Would you right, say? Right, as much. Exactly. Yeah. This is where I really believe that's, you know, what we're, we're talking about with this open door and the key of David. God held his hold back. You know, uh, and I say has because he still is to mm -hmm. some degree holding back those forces, uh, you know, um, and God has given the, the church even today great liberty. Uh, and that's why we need to seize it, which is probably yeah. we'll wait till the end to talk about that. But, <laughs> right, yeah, right. Yeah. But, the application, uh, yeah. but well, and yeah. so like even like going down to the reward. Um, you know, so verse 11, he says, hold fast that which thou hast, you know, another reference to holding fast to what they obviously held fast to. Um, yeah, well, uh, uh, obvious other tidbits that maybe if people haven't studied church history before, they don't know. Uh, Philadelphia is the only church uh, that's written to here that doesn't have a negative thing said about it. Mm -hmm. um, Laodicea. Yeah doesn't really have anything good said about it. So that's a, that's a fun juxtaposition there. Uh, but then in verse 12, he that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out. Uh, have you ever, I, you just taught church history. So do you make any correlation there between uh, the historical Philadelphian church age and how that church they went and then their reward for going is to not have to go? Or am I overstepping right. my boundaries there? 
Well, no, no, bro. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, they're they're you know Jerusalem above is the mother of us all, and then so they have this uh, inheritance. Your reward is affected, you know. And in, in Laodicea, that's actually the admonition, isn't it? That we're investing mm-hmm. in the wrong things, and uh, the Philadelphians invested in the right things mm-hmm. uh, to great sacrifice. Um, you know, when you look at these pioneering missionaries, every one of them, uh, you can go down the list. I mean, true pioneers. I mean, I. Well, let's go there. Let's go there. I think that's a natural trans transition. Let's let's get into some of the favorites, the uh, the figureheads of the Philadelphian Golden Age of missions. Mm-hmm. Who, who's your favorite? Let's just start there. Who's your favorite oh. to read about? You know, that's like saying, okay, read Hebrews eleven. Who's your fave? You know, ah, so, well, you know, we're carnal. We can do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> who's your favorite? Well, you know, um, I don't. I, it really is. It kind of probably depends on you know where I'm at. Um, I do have a lot of regard for William Carey because I've seen personally the the impact of his ministry. Um, some of the Bible projects we're working on and things like that to this day are impacted by his work. Wow. Uh, but but also Judson. You know, mm-hmm. Judson is amazing. Um, yeah, he's a Baptist and, superstar, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he is. And I think the thing about the, again, but what really draws me to a lot of these guys is is. Uh, and it wouldn't, I was captivated by their stories many years ago, you know, when you're reading their biographies and stuff, of course, but now that I've traveled and I've actually seen, you know, or I've heard, or I've met the people from Rangoon that say, mm-hmm. Oh yeah, Judson, I know, I know him. I'm wow. a Christian because of his, you know, it's just, it blows That's unreal. You, it just blows you away that this guy that was pioneering it's 200 years ago. <laughs> yeah. 200 years ago, he's losing his, his family. They're suffering. He's in prison. Uh, I mean, all the drama that went around all of that. Yeah. And, uh, and the sacrifice, you know, mm-hmm. and then I look, you know, like I've got a, I got a Bible sitting over here, a new Testament we put together. Um, it's his work. Mm-hmm. It's his work that we're still putting binding and shipping. And, 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 and so we'd run a video. This is a true story. I'm having a Bible conference, run a video and get a contact from a guy in Rangoon who's connected with Judson and Judson university. I'm saying is what oh, I'm okay. referring to Judson university and, uh, had his Bible training there and, and, and our Bibles from here that Judson actually was part of translating or going in a cart and container and going to back to Rangoon. I'm just like, wow. this is crazy. This huh. is incredible. So is just incredible. the legacy of these men that, uh, God used, they're just men, but man, right. But you, like you said, the legacy that it, it, it's just fruit that remains. I mean, yeah. that's what it is. And then their stories convict us and encourage us. And uh, Adoniram Judson's my personal favorite. I don't know if it's his story. He was one of the first missionary biographies that I picked up as a, as a young man. And uh, it just, it convicted me so much. And my wife wouldn't let me name my firstborn son Adoniram, which is probably a good call. Um, <laughs> so, but I, I would have, you know, maybe Judd. It would have been tough. He's going to be tough. Judson. Like his daddy. <laughs> 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 but he so Adoniram Judson was a missionary to Burma, Burma, which is modern day Myanmar. Um, and he one of the things that sticks out to me was not only his uh, enthusiasm for going and reaching the world in a time in America. So he was uh, it's often he's often referred to as the first American international missionary because there were other guys who went to different parts of the world first. But he was kind of the first or is regarded as the first guy to leave America uh, to go do this, you know, in the, you know, early to mid 19th century. And so he goes to Burma. Um, he's really famous for uh, the letter that he wrote to his fiance's father. Um, he hadn't married his wife yet. And he wrote this letter at Google it. Uh, if you have the time, cause I don't have it in front of me, but, uh, read that letter because, uh, Adoniram Judson got it. Um, he basically wrote a letter to his father-in-law that said, you know, I want to marry your daughter, but I, we're going to be missionaries. Are you willing to subject her to all the, all of any, just lists, all the difficulties and hardships and, and even death um, that she did end up succumbing to on the field? Um, you know, are you willing to subject your daughter to that for, for the glory of God and seeing her at the rapture? And, and it, it just convicted me so much, Brian, because I can hop on a plane and be anywhere in the world in a matter of a day or two. Um, I can go and I can Skype my family and see them every day via screen. And mm-hmm. when Adam Judson got on a boat with his wife, uh, he basically said, maybe I won't see you till the rapture. I mean, right. how can that not just convict you, you know? Yeah. Two weeks after they were married. <laughs> my goodness. And they yeah. were young too. They got married a little bit younger yeah. than we do nowadays. <laughs> yeah. I mean, can you imagine taking your wife, you get married two weeks later, you're, you're on a boat to, to India. And of course, and it's yeah. going to take months to get there on a boat. If you oh, get there, <laughs> it's worth a ticket. 
for all you know, it's a one way ticket. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, did she, I think she died there is my recollection. They never saw her again. She did. Um, I mean, she was there for a while. It's not like she died, like, you know, right when they got there, but she was right. also, man, if, if I can just talk about some of uh, just, as like a lady role model, like she, I don't even, I've never met her obviously, but just from reading, she was awesome as a, as a wife, as a pastor, missionary wife. She, so Adnar and Judson goes to jail eventually. Cause the emperor of Burma, you know, is, you know, who is this guy? And they, they put him in jail and he's in like a bamboo jail. And, and, mm-hmm. uh, you read some of the documentaries about like the, his physique and how physically beat up he was. And she came every day to the jailhouse and like set up a tent and like would would persuade the jailer to let her take food and she would be pleasant and nice to the jailer so she could give food to her husband. And uh, I think even got a meeting with the emperor or something, if I'm not mistaken, like, man, yeah, they man. were just awesome. I, I'm a I'm a fanboy of Adnarm Chudson and his wife. <laughs> man, bro, they are, they are outstanding, uh, incredible sacrifice, you know, and uh, it's it's amazing how, you know, also, I believe she had to protect, and this is my, I'm going off my recollection yeah, here. Same. It's all but good. I, yeah. But I'm, I believe that she ended up protecting uh, the scripture. Oh, you're right. You're right. Oh, I'm so glad you jogged my memory on that. Yeah. Cause his life's work was tied yeah. up in the scripture and, uh, she and literally up- in a pillowcase. So he's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Adnarm Chudson completed an entire translation of the Bible into Burmese. And uh, he was like mostly done with it when he was in jail and hit it and his wife like hit it in a pillowcase and and like, yeah, kept it safe. I mean, yeah, Yeah. that was all her. Um, Let's go to William Carey. I'm less versed. I I like Adam Judson. I just am kind of a fanboy. I've got his baseball cards. Right. So (laughs) I know his stats. Uh, William Carey, though, um, is known as the father of modern missions. Uh, Why is he given that title, Brian? Well, you know, William Carey was uh, in England, was a pioneer, um, you know, and he lived in the uh, 17, 1800s there. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, you know, he was going against the grain of a lot of the, you know, a lot of the same things we're going against today uh, in regard <laughs> to some theology that, that would prohibit um, a missions mindset, a biblical uh, following of the Great Commission. So mm-hmm. he, he took the Great Commission literally and felt like uh, he and many others uh, needed to, we needed to literally go and uh, follow these these opportunities that God was opening around the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he was rebuked uh, by a gentleman. Um, I, I might have that quote somewhere. I got it. Oh, uh, isn't it something about the, uh, you know, if God wants to save the heathen, he'll do it yeah, you yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's find that quick. Which caused him to, yeah, it's a, a, a doctor. It was John Ry- Ryland Sr., uh, chairman of, a, of a, an association that he was a part of, said, young man, sit down, thou art, now you are an enthusiast. When hmm. God pleases to con, con, uh, converse with the heathen, He'll do it without consulting you or me. Besides, there must be another Pentecostal gift of tongues. And of course, uh, with that, William Carey uh, decided that he would write his little thesis, uh, you know, on the need for missionaries to go forth. And uh, I think the title of that was. Um, Inquiry into the obligations of Christians to win the heathen. It's a really so, catchy title. Yeah, yeah, that, is, that <laughs> sells well under a million copies there. So, uh, but uh, yeah, that really became his thesis paper, and and uh, so he ended up. You know, a lot of people he, they call him the shoe cobbler and kind of minimizing, mm-hmm. but he was he was trained and prepared uh, in language as well. His, he had a translation mindset. He was going there to translate the word of God mm-hmm. and uh, he ended up dragging his wife on the boat. She, she didn't want to go. And it was yeah, a weird, it's a weird per- story. I, I don't recommend yeah. it. You know, yeah. if anyone, <laughs> if there's That's anybody not- listening right now who wants to be a missionary, yeah. I, I would make sure your wife's on board, but you know yeah, what, William yeah. Carey, he was the father of modern missions. So, you know, it, I yeah. guess he gets grace there. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, after that time, the, the biggest probably work, uh, you know, was Moravian work, which is really a, a residue of the pious and the Lutherans, um, you know, in the, in the, yes. in your neck of the woods. Uh, Count Zinzendorf. <laughs> yeah. Zinzendorf. Uh, yeah, with the the Moravians, uh, that was early 18th century, I believe. Hold on, actually, I've got some notes here about. Cause yeah, you're those, right in in New Philadelphia, in our area, um, just in our county and stuff. There's a lot of Moravian missionaries that kind of settled our area. Yeah, that'd be said. Cool. 16th century, uh, 1700 to 1760 or so. But those guys, you know, they were they were more really. We kind of follow a little bit closer to that model in our groups. Um, you know, where we 
support locally and send to the world. Uh-huh. Um, but really, when uh, uh, Kerry did, it was he was able to marshal the resources once he got started of of really what becomes known as modern missions agencies. So um, he oh, was, gotcha. Yeah, you know, back in the Moravian day, uh, their first missionaries went like to Greenland and then to uh, yeah. the British Isles and places like that. And it was a one way ticket, man. And it was you you yeah. were a slave or you got a job. or you Right. Well, and some of them sold themselves into slavery yeah, just to, yeah. to reach slaves. I mean, unreal. Yeah. 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 And so it was kind of, you know, uh, if you didn't have a business model for doing missions, you were in trouble because uh, mm-hmm. there wasn't any support coming from home. Whereas Carrie, you know, was able to marshal the support of, uh, you know, missionary giving um, mm-hmm. and and uh, and so to support him on the field. And uh, when he got there, uh, he, you know, he was able to uh, do a lot of work in regard to uh, his first convert, by the way, he didn't come for years. Uh, I forget the number of years off the top of my head, but several years before his first convert. Mm-hmm. And so he worked tirelessly, you know, um, and, and eventually he did. Um, have his first Indian convert is after seven years of working there. Wow. Um, he finally had a convert and then he established a mission and converted these Hindus. But uh, he had the Bible published in six languages in the New Testament, 23 languages. I mean, this guy did a lot of work and Jeez. over the time that he was there. And, uh, and again, there's people I know. Um, there was a young lady back in the nineties that was in our, uh, in my institute with, during during my time in shepherd school, who literally was out of a church that was started by William Carey. Uh, wow. So it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. And yeah. then so you've got uh, so William Carey, and I know another one of your favorites, and and, a, and another huge name in uh, the Philadelphian Church Age is Hudson Taylor, founder of the China yeah. Inland Mission. You want to talk about him a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I before, I, if I may, uh, please. I want to talk about Hudson. I want to just throw a shout out to Robert Morrison. Okay. Uh, because uh, I think I really, you know, Hudson Taylor built on what Robert Morrison laid before him. And hmm. uh, Robert Morrison was the, one of the first guys in. Uh, and uh, China was very hostile to missionaries um, initially. And Robert Morrison probably bore the brunt of that as, as much as anybody. Uh, he wasn't, you know, as prolific in his effect probably because, well, it was completely closed. So he did a lot of pioneering work. Mm, a lot of ground tilling. Yeah, yeah. He he developed a dictionary of the Chinese language. He did a lot of uh, very important work in language um, just to try to get uh, some some common, uh, I hate to use the word bridge, but an avenue for communicating mm-hmm. with the Chinese. And of course, the business people, kept, you know, that's really what kept him on the field because they hated missionaries. They hated him. And the Jesuits also hated him. They uh. They actively uh, worked against him his whole time there. Uh, and we're, not, we're talking his life was at stake. It wasn't just like, you know, writing bad news about him in the paper. Uh, this guy, they were after him. Yeah, they were after him. And Man. so he he uh, he endured and uh, and uh, did a good work and was wise. I think he was really uh, very wise in the way he handled everything. Uh, desperate situations, no backup plan, no safety net, no training, no, yeah. just very rudimentary, you know, just surviving at many times. Uh, so, and then Hudson Taylor followed in behind him. And the reason I wanted to mention Robert Morrison is because, you know, Hudson Taylor is known as, as, a, as you know, really prolific. And, and I think that a lot of the reason that Hudson Taylor, you know, was able to continue to be so successful uh, was because of guys, the pioneering work of guys like Robert Morrison. So that's awesome. Uh, and they were both pioneers in their own rights. And so, of course, Hudson Taylor, you know, when he entered the field, it was still difficult. And, uh, you know, he's noted a lot of times for taking on the the clothing and the and the uh, the customs. Yeah, uh, the cultural adaptation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is really popular today. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Robert Morrison tried to do the same thing initially, though. Really? Uh, yeah, he did. And it didn't work for him very well. <laughs> so he went back to they did. They just they just it wasn't because he didn't want to. It just it just literally that wasn't a, it was probably the, the right thing at the wrong time, wow. which is a lesson to missionaries. Uh, there's places in the world, even to this day, where the indigenous will look at you like you're crazy, man. What are you doing? You're from the West. So uh, <laughs> so. Uh, at any rate, uh, Morrison lost credibility, but Hudson gained credibility, mm. and and he was able because the doors were open to be able to connect a little bit better with the common people, and have access to them. And uh, and when he did that, of course, he moved in. He moved. That's why he started the Ch- Chinese Inland Mission. He did that to get away from 
the Western influence and to get more connected to uh, really the indigenous heart of, of China. Mm. And it's interesting, too, because when you look back at those days, they were they were stirred up. This, uh, this is something to think about for all of us Laodiceans. They were stirred up. Uh, there's a quote by Robert Morrison's. I'm going back to Robert Morrison again. Uh, his pastors uh, said, uh, or I may be confusing him and Hudson Taylor. So forgive me if I'm getting my facts uh, discombobulated. Yeah, no worries. But one of these guys, their pastor stirred him up. And um, uh, I believe it was Morrison uh, and said, there's 300 and some, I think 50, 350 million souls that have heard not yet heard the gospel mm. and like 350 million souls. that's the population of the united states today wow you know and there's two billion souls right now in china mm. so i think about just the population explosion and, and our need to get the gospel where it needs to go yeah. it's incredible. and the so, amount of unheards in the world not not just people who are lost but people who haven't even heard yeah they don't even have a clue yeah so Hudson Taylor, I mean, man, that guy, again, through much hardship and, uh, you know, difficulty, his consecration level was, uh, even for that, the Philadelphian church age, he, he was, his mindset was, uh, you must be willing to give your life, period. Mm -hmm. That's it. There's no, there is no turning back there. You put your hand to the plow. He was extreme. And, and it really drew a lot of people into the missions. Um, he, you know, he would pray for a hundred missionaries and the next year there'd be 102. Hmm. Uh, and so he really expanded. He came back and made a circuit to the United States. And I think he may have uh, worked with Luther Rice as well. They were calling missionaries into action. And, um, just much like what we want to do, like your, your pastor, Jeff Bartell is, is really minded to do. And, and man, I tell you, they, people responded. Maybe somebody hmm. listening to this podcast, will, you know, they need to get stirred up and respond. Yeah. And, uh, they went and, uh, and he just changed the course of, of hmm. missions. And, That's uh, awesome. Yeah, and that, that tension, of course, uh, is credited also for the Boxer Rebellion and some other things. But uh, <laughs> but uh, he was quite a pioneer in his own right, another American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. And of yeah. course, there's guys, I mean, we don't need to spend much time on, but like George Mueller, uh, maybe a little bit more of... Uh, uh, doesn't fit in the box as much because he... So he was a, a German preacher. Uh, he founded uh, orphan homes, mostly. He, he started as a preacher and was and founded these uh, homes for orphans and whatnot and uh and so he's not he's not that fundamental like cross cultural international missionary but what was so special about him in that time period um was uh, the prayer warrior that he was and uh the the conviction you can get from reading his autobiography about how he never asked for a dime to uh to do any of the ministry he did he just simply always asked God and literally like God would come through like the day that like we don't have any food in the house, God to feed these hundred orphans, uh, would you supply it for us? And then like the day that they needed it, it, it would come. And, um, so his name's worthy of at least mentioning, even if, you know, we're not like delving too deep into him. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think we probably, many of us have read the account, you know, like you said, where he's literally at the table praying and, and the food shows up at the door. Right. Uh, and, you know, a good goal that we can all aspire. Um, it said that, you know, that Mueller, uh, he lived off his tithe, right? And he gave 90% to the Lord. That was his model. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, actually, there's a good veggie tale about George Mueller that I was watching with my son this morning. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, another guy that really speaks to me uh, is a guy named David Brainerd, and we don't hear a whole lot about him. He was early, early 1700s, um, a young man who felt called to the Native Americans. So he's another American. Uh, let me see. I've got this somewhere. He served primarily among the Delaware Indio Indians in New Jersey. Um, mm -hmm. And he's a young man who just... Uh, went through a lot of difficulty and, and kind of like you've been saying, Brian, a lot of these missionaries, they didn't see a lot of success early in their ministry or even in their lifetime. It's, it's since been built upon, uh, since their lives have ended. And, uh, I think that's what is really encouraging for us that like, you don't know what God's going to use you for even after we're gone potentially. Um, but David, uh, Brainerd died at 29 a young age, uh, by all accounts in his journals and stuff, it doesn't seem like he really thought he accomplished much, but, uh, just a quick Google search will show you that, um, his journals and biographies inspired the likes of missionaries like William Carey, Jim Elliott, 
Uh, so that man, his life, although it was short lived and his ministry, maybe some people would even objectively say wasn't that successful, uh, inspired the likes of other men to go and uh, do the same thing. And they were very successful. Yeah. David Brainerd is a, you know, he's God used him in my life. I, I, oh, yeah? I read his biography. Oh yeah. As a young man, I read his, you know, it was, it comes highly recommended. Everyone should, you know, if you're Absolutely. a young man, especially just really look at his, his biography. And he's, uh, you know, he was a little, uh, again, he was, he's a little bit like Hudson Taylor, just, uh, you know, he was kicked out of Bible college, <laughs> maybe like Brett, Brett Bartlett. I don't know. So, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, maybe not for the same reasons, but, uh, uh, why did I bring that up? I don't know. I'm in trouble now. But, <laughs> it's all right. He's not here. <laughs> he's not here. To finish, which really makes me look admirable. But, uh, Anyhow, but uh, no, he was, he was, you know, almost ascetic, you know, and I look at, I don't know if you've read a lot of his diary, but I'm like, man, this dude was, he was, uh, he was a deep prayer warrior, you mm -hmm. know, and, uh, and of course, asceticism is not a good thing, but uh, he really, he really was, you know, willing to give his life for the cause of Christ. And he did, you know, mm -hmm. for the American Indians he and, did. and he didn't have a lot of success. There was a guy, uh, since we're talking about American Indians, a guy named John Elliott, not not to be confused with uh, Jim Elliott. Uh, Jim Elliott, yeah, and he he predated Brainerd. Um, really? Yeah, he was a Puritan, so you mm -hmm. know. But you know, I tell you what, when you look at his his life, he was he was a Christian. I mean, this guy uh, he reached out to the Indians um, there near Boston. He was only like five miles outside of Boston. Hmm. Uh, and I think one of the things when you read, even, you know, we're giving some homage to, to David Brainerd. You think about guys uh, like Jonathan Edwards, who who ended up, uh, you know, you think, well, he was a pastor and a scholar. Uh, yeah, yeah. The the preached uh, sinners in the hand of angry God. Yeah, yeah. But he, in his own right, was in a pioneering mode uh, trying to establish a colony. He was worried about in the midst of this incredible study he was doing. He was worried about being attacked by American Indians. And I mean, he, <laughs> it was not the America that we think of, you know. This, yeah, it was the new world at that time. <laughs> it was, yeah, this was a missions field. So these guys were in their own rights. They were sure. fine. Uh, but yeah, John, this guy, John, uh, John Elliott was, uh, he's worthy of a look too, because he did a lot of things. Uh, he he was going against the, uh, the norms, just much like William Carey mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and made very personal relationships, translated the first, first Bible translated on this continent is likely his Bible. The, and, really? Uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, particular Indian group that he was ministering to, I think there was, you know, several groups, they had their own autonomous uh, governing system. So they were self-sufficient and, and, and uh, they had their own Bible. Uh, and then they got wiped out in, uh, in some trade mm -hmm. wars, uh, King Philip's war or what have you. So, and uh, there is a copy though of this Bible at the, the Bible museum in oh, Washington. Wow see yeah so you can still see the original copy but hmm. but uh, that was the work of a of a guy like david brainerd as well that a lot of time it gets skipped over in history but wow uh, yeah i didn't know about yeah. him that's awesome yeah yeah well again these there's a lot of work that's been done and that's the oh, thing yeah well and we couldn't even do justice to all the people yeah. and i mean it was the golden age of missions and it lasted several hundred years and we're just kind of hitting a couple of highlights. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. David Brainer had a huge influence though. You know, I, I'm sure a guy like John Phillips had, or uh, I said, John Phillips, John uh, Elliott mm -hmm. had uh, a lot of influence on David Brainerd. And sure. Well, and you said that David Brainerd had influence in your life. How, what, what a specific. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just his commitment. Um, you know, his consecration, the level of consecration mm -hmm. that David Brainerd had really encouraged me uh, as a young man to, to really lay aside, you know, um, the trappings of this world, you know, and, yeah. and to focus on the kingdom of God and put, you know, Colossians chapter three said, <laughs> seek the kingdom of God and, or that's Matthew six, but Colossians three set our affection on things above. And, uh, you know, and he just, that's what David Brainerd did. I mean, he was completely given to the mission of God. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he, he had the power of God on his life. He was, he was, uh, uh, you know, he being dead, he still speaks, right. His yeah. diary goes on and, and, uh, encourages, hmm. uh, I believe David Livingston was also one of the, the missionaries that was. Oh, you might. I didn't even have David Livingston on my list. Man, shame on me. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, yeah um, David Livingston was a, uh, not CT stud, but he was a stud. <laughs> and CT stud was a stud as well. <laughs> yeah, <he was. laughs> uh, you know, another guy that, uh, you know, not a missionary, but this Philadelphian church age preachers. Cause I mean, like, 
uh, time would fail us to even go into Charles Spurgeon. I mean, he wasn't a missionary, but he was that that Philadelphian age preacher um, that did amazing things, obviously. A, a guy that I always liked in that David Brainerd camp was a, a Scottish preacher named Robert Murray McShane. Um, mm-hmm. He, uh, not as well known, I don't even honestly know how I stumbled <laughs> over him. It might've just been a free Kindle book that I, or a cheap Kindle book that I bought, you know? Um, but he was a, a preacher. He died when he was 29 as well. And that stuck out to me in my early twenties. And, and I, I read his, uh, his autobiography or diary and, um, the guy, he wanted to burn himself out for the Lord and did he like, he didn't die of like medical issues. He died of old age as a 29 year old. Cause he just burnt himself out. Um, it's, it's been said, I don't even, I don't know if this is true, but it's been said in other books that he had a watch that like on the watch, he like put something over the timepiece that I can't remember the word, but said, basically said something like, you know, it's time to work for the Lord or something, you know? <laughs> um, and you know, back in my early twenties, I was like, man, that would be cool if I could work so hard burn myself out for the Lord and die when I'm 29 and I'm 29 today. And, uh, I don't agree with that sentiment today. Um, and my wife certainly doesn't either. So, <laughs> but, uh, man, th- those guys are just so encouraging at their passion for the ministry of the Lord. Amen. It's a good place to start though. It's rare to be zealous and, uh, you know, zealously affecting a good thing. Mm. So I'm glad I gave you some wisdom on that though. That is amazing though. That guy, you know, I think we also underestimate the hardship, you know, today, like you say, we get on a plane and we travel and, uh, but even today, you know, when you, one of the things when we do travel, it is hard, uh, to live, um, oftentimes in some of the places that we go, mm-hmm. um, you know, t- even to this day, uh, in many of the continents that we visit and, uh, the places where missionaries and now indigenous pastors have to, to have to work. And you can only imagine what it would have been like two centuries ago. Right. Right. Yeah, no roads, been, no airports. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no penicillin, you know? Yeah. So, oh man. Yeah. Fever's going to take things. you out. Yeah. The little things. So these yeah. guys, they faced a lot of difficulty and hardship and Sure. Do you want to speak on just uh, briefly here? Um, so, so we talked about like Jonathan Edwards briefly and like the Puritans. Um, so that I believe, let me check here. I, yeah. That kind of falls under that, that first great awakening the, in the American great awakenings, which all the three great awakenings are that are commonly cited. They happened during that Philadelphian church age. Um, but that first one would have been guys like Jonathan Edwards, uh, George Whitfield, uh, probably John Wesley, guys like that. Uh-huh. Um, and then you've got the the second great awake, awakening, which you know it, it typically associated with like uh, abolition and women's rights movement, and uh, and then the third great awakening would be like uh, mid eighteen hundreds ish. You got like uh, D.L. Moody, Charles Finney, guys like that. Um, what what those great awakenings that were in America at that point, but but in that Philadelphian Church age, what did that have? What role did that play in Christianity and then in world missions? Do you think? Oh, well, a lot, obviously. (laughs) Sure. You know, uh, and again, for all of us, myself included, most of us don't remember America before being a superpower. You know, we weren't a superpower until the Second World War. Hmm. So uh, America was free. And and so these, uh, you know, these 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 men, America was also in need of being reached. You know, I think a lot. I don't know. It's just interesting going. Let's just kind of go back to to the Wesleys in uh, Whitfield, mm-hmm. you know, the Wesleys, of course, they didn't have a gospel. Uh, they got the, a workspace gospel until later on in mm-hmm. their ministry, uh, coming from that Anglican background. But Whitfield was born again, and uh, he was successful in Georgia, but they were convinced that he couldn't be because the heathen, not not the indigenous heathen, as they, as they call it, but the the uh, populace of, of the colonies mm-hmm. uh, were considered so, you know, rugged. And course that, uh, you know, they weren't, they weren't worth reaching, you know? Oh, wow. uh, so, yeah. These, these people were hard and, you know, they were, of course, uh, God had already slated them for destruction. So Whit- Whitfield <laughs> comes in and, uh, and uh, preaches the gospel and they get saved, you know, and there's revivals in that first great awakening, of course. And guys like, uh, it, it was huge, you know, just, just that God was working when we talk about the Philadelphian church age and, mm-hmm. and opening a door. Uh, you know, geographically, we were uh, in a lot better position to reach the the Far East hmm. uh, in many respects. Um, and we we also were in a situation where the the, uh, you know, the formation of of the form of government that we we, we had or have um, 
you know, was was being pounded out by trying to figure out, you know, how to get away from this model that came to him from the Reformation. Guys like Jonathan Edwards were like, this isn't right. This isn't working. This isn't biblical. My congregation is lost. Uh, being a member of this church uh, through baptism doesn't is not regeneration, you mm-hmm. know. So they were trying to sort through this theology, and wow. uh, and, uh, and 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 you know, God, give God credit. God brought revival. Sure, uh, whether it was by uh, Puritans and Anglicans or whoever, uh, you know, uh, the Word of God was was uh, quite effectual. And so Whitfield was, you know, I, I have a lot of admiration for Whitfield. Uh, just he was an incredible force. Mm. Uh, and there's no doubt God's good hand was on him. And then following him, of course, uh, D.L. Moody's, um, you know, in the 1800s and mid 1800s. And that guy, uh, again, another guy, his, his, you know, you can still see the, the, the remnant, <clears throat> at least the, the fruit of his ministry. Mm-hmm. So um, I could go on and on talking yeah. about those guys. But well, they you, were, make, you make a really good point that I actually didn't think about till you said it, Brian. We do always, or at least me and maybe the younger crowd, we, we think of America only as we know it, a world power, uh, Rome, if you will. And, and <clears throat> during those great awakenings in the Philadelphian church age, it was a colonial mission field. And so even the guys that we would say were just American preachers or whatever, you're absolutely right. Those, those guys were missionaries trying to reach where they lived. Um, I, I, I hadn't thought about it like that previously. That's a really yeah, good America was a mission field. Mm-hmm. That's what's so outstanding to me about the Philadelphian church age in regard to American missions. And you see guys, seeing guys like Hudson Taylor and, um, and these men going out um, and Judson um, because America was not established uh, in many respects. It would still be like a mission field. Mm. And, and that informs us when we go and train indigenous pastors in other locations that, listen, I know you're considered the mission field, but, don't wait until you're a oh, superpower, you know, go now. Yeah. And that's what those guys did. They didn't, they didn't wait until America had World War One and two under their belt. You know, they, they were going by faith. And, wow. uh, and so, yeah, you know, in America was still needing missionaries here and sending missionaries to the, you know, the Indians on the frontier and so on and so forth. So yeah, it was, it was quite a different time. And, um, and these men really did, um, uh, you know, walk by faith, yeah. Uh, the Bible missionary societies were started and the word of God and the McGuffey reader, mm-hmm. you know, was one of the ways that this continent was uh, King James Bible and the McGuffey reader. That's how people were <laughs> educated in, in liberal arts education. They literally could think they could read wow. Shakespeare. They were they were very intelligent. And um, and so God used those great awakenings. And and, and of course, America it tend to fall back into sin quite regularly. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, and, and kind of bringing it back full circle to what we talked about uh, with the reason the golden age of missions, Philadelphia was a, an open door uh, because that uh, the Bible in English. And so England played such a role, like you said, the sun never set on the English uh, empire um, because, so they had their tentacles spread over all the earth. And because of that guys took that Bible and went all over the earth and preached the gospel. And so not only did people learn English, but they learned the Bible and people got saved. And then obviously that all makes its way to America, like like we're talking about. And then somewhere England kind of drops the Bible and becomes very atheistic in, in a modern day sense. And then America takes up the mantle and the baton and starts taking the the Bible to the nations. And God has honored that uh, up to this point. And I pray that we continue to do that so that God's blessing stays on us. Yeah. I, I want to, I just, I, I know we're talking about missions, but uh, I, I just got to throw a shout out to yeah the Baptists. Um, um, oh, you um, got you always shout out Baptists. Yeah. Out because, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are like, uh, I think, I really do believe Anabaptist or, uh, you know, people with Baptistic doctrine, let's just say that, are the, the key to the Reformation and even to motivating people like uh, Tyndale, mm. uh, the, those Lollards that would be out preaching. Uh, that had a grip on the word like we do. Mm. Um, and, and so, you know, it really is the rise when you see when you see uh, after the, the Revolutionary War, um, the rise of the Baptistic doctrine, the Baptist churches are now at liberty. They're no longer being persecuted by the Anglicans and the Catholics. And they have a little bit of space. Um, man, man, does God open the door mm. uh, for people like us? And that's and I want to I do want to say that because. It is people like us you know, that have really done a lot for missions um, in the last 200 years. Hmm. Um, and so, um, and I, you know, I don't want to break our arm, part, patting ourselves on the back. <laughs> but, 
but uh, and I'm not saying we're alone in that, but uh, sure. that really did precipitate a lot of the American missions movement is that freedom, that liberty, that open right. door. Well, and that, like you said, whenever when God opened the door and kind of uh, the government stopped or or the any the, the other religions even stopped stopped persecuting so much, man, those those early bat they took it and ran when when they had the freedom to man, they just they went for it. Right, man, they did not hold back, and that's why guys like Hudson Taylor were so you know so animated about getting to the field. Mm. And, and you figure that was that, that liberty had only been with them you know a hundred years. Yeah, so this is this is a small window in time. Sure. Well, and, and guys like uh, Adoniram Judson, I, I don't have it in front of me. I'd have to go find the, the biography. But uh, So he, he comes back to the States at one point in his old age. Um, I believe it was Adoniram Judson. If I get it wrong, you know, forgive me, but I believe it was him. He's my favorite, so I've read the most about him. Uh, it was in his old age, he was at a church service, and people wanted him uh, to, to just get up and tell stories because he was famous uh, you know, for all of his missions endeavors. And he got up, he preached a sermon, he preached the gospel, and he sat down. And uh, the preacher of the church kind of said, hey, you know, brother, they kind of want to hear some stories of heroism and heathens and all this stuff. And he said, and he basically says something to the effect of, brother, I ain't got time for that. The gospel is what people need to hear. And uh, if you want stories, you can get someone else. Uh, that's my paraphrase. But you just got to love how sold out those guys were for the gospel and getting that to people who need to hear it. Amen. Amen. And uh, so really, I guess let's let's bring it full circle here. And why do we talk about this? Well, it's important to know history because, you know, if you don't know history, then uh, you're either doomed to repeat the bad parts or you won't actually, you know, know where you're going if you don't know where you came from. Um, but for me, and I know other guys, missionaries that are on the field, uh, reading these men of antiquity uh, convicted and encouraged them to consider, okay, if these guys gave their lives in this way in a time when it was so dreadfully hard and they literally gave everything for the cross, why can't I? So, Brian, could you make this practical for us? How can we be convicted and encouraged by the lives of these guys as, as we are involved in missions today, whether we be missionaries, church members, pastors supporting missions? How, how can we let the lives of these men from a couple hundred years ago impact us today in missions? And ministry. Yeah, and I think that you know, in First Corinthians chapter ten, it talks about you know the, the things that we've seen in the Old Testament, right? Are there for examples and examples, and uh, I think that is what's so exciting about their lives. First, of course, we have to digest it and imagine them, you know, and, and put our take the time to to kind of get to know them and their field and and really what moves them, and it it'll move us um, as as you know because. Uh, really where we put our treasures, where our heart's going to go. Mm. And uh, when you look at their examples, uh, you know, eventually you need to sample uh, that example mm. and look for opportunities. Uh, you, you see these men that stand and it is like reading, uh, you know, Hebrews 11. But these are people within, uh, you know, context of history, that which are not far. Uh, these are people that, that you do know. Mm. Um, literally today, we know people that are that are still doing these types of things and and find out how to get in on that. And uh, and that's uh, in local churches that believe the word of God, that teach the word of God, that have a faith based view of the Bible and and have a have a, a mind for missions because they're following the Great Commission. You know, I would encourage everybody to take advantage of those first steps. All these great men started somewhere. A lot of them uh, started as uh, kids and their parents were praying for them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hudson Taylor, his, his parents prayed for him to go to China because their pastor had a burden for China. And uh, and then he ended up fulfilling that. And so it may be a vision that it was started with your parents. Don't blow it off. Right. If you're a young person, uh, Hudson Taylor was in the world for a while. He got drunk and was doing silly stuff and finally repented and got his life together and, and realized that God didn't didn't have him here for that. Right. So mm -hmm. we got to really uh, these guys can be examples to us. of uh, They're not unvarnished. I mean, these are people or uh, they are unvarnished. I should say they're, they're sometimes we read their stories and that is a varnished truth. But you can you can look behind that. And you can start to see these are just guys like us. Um, yeah. Real men. They're, they're just real men. And, and and you can you can follow their example in regard to, to obeying the Lord. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a good Bible believing church that teaches and preaches the word of God, you should submit yourself to discipleship. You should do the basics. Um, and allow God to captivate your heart. And if you know, if you know, like you know, that you know that God is already calling you to that, man, you need to submit to it. You need to let yourself go and allow God to see. And, and look at the end game, too, because, man, the the, the joy uh, 
uh, getting a hold of the of the eternal weight and glory is the key of the Philadelphian church age. These guys understood that there was no sacrifice too great, that there was no, uh, you know, uh, no uh, journey too far. And uh, there was no hardship that was too difficult that would not be rewarded, you know, with an eternal weight and glory that is not worthy to be compared to the sufferings of this present time. Mm. And so I think as Laodiceans, we got to shake ourselves off of uh, the contemporary mindset that we have even in the church and lay hold on these on these uh, mm. on these examples that we have and look for examples, people in our life even today that we can join with, like you, you got your pastor who's gone out there and. Uh, you know, people that are actually doing it and get involved in these short term missions trips and and actually start to engage and allow God to take you to the next right step in regard to your obedience to the Lord and and go as far as, as God will take you. Amen. Yeah. You know what, Brian? Uh, I think just thinking about it now, I think a good way to wrap this up would if you wouldn't mind going back to Revelation three, let's just read the letter that that God writes to Laodicea. Now that we've looked at what he wrote to Philadelphia and kind of looked in history at what that church accomplished, and now let's look at the admonition that the Lord gives us in our age today, and maybe that's a good way for us to consider these words. Sure. So we'll be in Revelation chapter 3 and in, in verse 14, uh, picking up where we left off. It says, Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Mm. And let's, let's hear that, church. Laodicea, if you guys don't know, it means the rights of the people. Um, and I don't know a better way to describe our age than that or what Christ says there in uh, verse 15. Um, I know thy works. You're neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot, but you're lukewarm. And uh, man, if I could just encourage anyone listening to this, if you're considering missions or just considering how you can be a better part in world evangel- uh, evangelization, can I just ask you, man, don't be lukewarm. Let's be all in for the Lord. We don't have that much time left. Laodicea is the last church age before Revelation 4-1 when John, as a picture and type of the church, gets raptured off when he hears the trumpet sound. Um, we're, we're at the jumping off point, and we need to we need to reach the world. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for being on here. you have any last things to say? I just want to thank you. I don't know how I drew the straw in the Philadelphian church age, but I'm thankful for it. So I appreciate it. Well, I just wanted to talk to someone smart and uh, (laughs) you're super smart. So thanks, man. (laughs) man. Thanks, man. God bless. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. Well, there you have it. I hope you guys were encouraged and convicted by uh, uh, the stories that Brian uh, was able to share about those Philadelphian church age brothers and sisters who uh, really laid their life on the altar, laid it all down. Uh, to be able to give their life for uh, for the Great Commission's sake and for the sake of the souls uh, all around the world who need to hear about Christ. I, I hope that uh, gives you a burden um, to think about the, the men and women who have went before us who uh, didn't have all the pleasures that we have today in, in Western civilization in the 21st century. Um, man, could I just encourage you and challenge you? Don't let the this world system keep you comfortable and tempt you to just stay and live this American dream and not be involved in the mission somehow. You know, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they are as active as ever right now. And and uh, and I fear that they keep a lot of American and Western uh, Christians comfortable enough 
to where they won't fully give their lives uh, and surrender their lives to be used by God in whatever manner possible. And man, it, it would just be thrilling to me if somebody is listening to this and uh, and it impacts them in a way that they would consider giving their lives to the mission. I will leave you with this. This is a quote from missionary Jim Elliott. And Jim Elliott wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't in the Philadelphian church age, actually. He was in the early Laodicean uh, age, the early 1900s. And uh, Jim Elliott was uh, one of five missionaries in the 1950s along with Nate Saint, um, who was killed in Ecuador, Ecuador uh, by a spear um, by a tribe that they were trying to reach with the gospel. And uh, what Jim Elliott said in, in one of his most famous quotes is, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Uh, what an amazing quote from a man who literally gave his life for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of souls. Uh, but man, can I just encourage us and challenge us today, Laodicea, church age Christians. We need to give our lives that which we cannot keep this temporal world, these, these temporal riches that we cannot keep. We, we need to give that up, whatever that is, whether that means you change your address to take the gospel to the ends of the world, or that means you simply go without some of the pleasantries and the pleasures that we've grown accustomed to so that you can give more of your time and talents and treasure to the mission and supporting global missions. Can I just challenge you that, uh, Philadelphia, and those church age brothers and sisters, the golden age of missions, they gave everything for the Great Commission. They took the, the gospel to the ends of the world. Um, we don't have a license to not do the same. We ought to be doing the same thing. And it's even easier for us to do it today as we can jump on a plane and be anywhere in the world in a matter of days. So uh, thank you guys so much for listening. We'll see you back next week. God bless. Thanks for listening. Please rate and subscribe and share us on social media. Also, please make sure to check out our other podcast, Theology Roundtable, at theologyroundtable.com.